Welcome to Open Source Workplace interview series. If this is your first time, please hit that subscribe button. Uh, today, I'm very excited to be bringing you an interview I carried out last week uh, in person with Andrew Moss. And the good thing about this video, you don't have to see me, it's all Andrew. So uh, that should be a plus for you to, to hang around and, and listen to all that of Andrew's wisdom. Um, I want to thank Andrew for taking the time to, to meet with us to meet with me and obviously bring bring this content to you. So stick around, watch Andrew. So now let's bring you the interview. So Andrew, yeah, uh, you're in New York, the yeah. awards again. Oh, well, Come well, on. You know. So uh, well, what actually, you've been in the industry for a while, yeah. what actually, uh, what motivated you or incentivized you to sort of get into this? How did you get into, into the workplace area? Um, well, I, I guess I always knew from a, pretty young age somehow that I wanted to run a business. I didn't really know what that business was going to be. And I stumbled into the IT industry and eventually got involved in a program on intelligent buildings. And that was what led me into the whole world of the, the crazy world of the workplace. And that was about 27 years ago. Uh, prior to that, I'd been involved in quality management, change management, done a lot in technology. The closest I got to doing anything around space was I had a, an A-level in technical drawing of all things. And uh, so, you know, really brought all those different things together. And then, of course, back in 1992, when we started the business, a lot of the things that we now, certainly in certain parts of the world, take for granted around mobility and agility and mobile working, there was, uh, those weren't uh, at all common currency. So, you know, we had to kind of learn pretty quickly that what are we going to sell to pay the, the mortgage? Where, and with the first thing we do was to go into benchmarking, actually, around uh, workplace services. And at one point, we had a group of about 40 companies in the UK, all coming together, little study groups, doing some benchmarking, some learning stuff. And it was very good. The problem we had was that everybody kind of started to know us as those people who do benchmarking, which was never really what we wanted to do. Um, but of course, what happened also was that our consult consulting business started to flourish. And so we, you know, we kind of morphed out of that into, uh, into consulting. So it's, um, yeah, it's a lot of, a lot of fun. Yeah, no, I, and obviously we, we met that a couple of years ago in Seattle. Mm. Uh, we were doing a tour around Microsoft and we got kind of got connected and we sort of have a lot of alignment. One of the things I've always respected about you and your approach is it's evidence based. Mm -hmm. And you know, your journey and always providing that evidence. So yeah. what, what sort of things do just yeah. interest you and how do you think a lot of that research has impacted? What well, I think that, that that desire for sort of an evidence based approach, I think comes from the fact that I actually did a degree in applied st statistics many, many years ago, which which I have to say is probably one of the smarter things I, I did in my uh, my earlier years. But if you do a degree in applied statistics, it, it, it breeds by definition a scientific approach and, and, a, and a questioning of the, uh, you know, things that you see out there, a questioning of data. And so, you know, it's always been a bit of a surprise to me when I got into the workplace area, um, a bit less now, but how little real science there was around it. You know, we had a lot of people, particularly, I guess, from the design and the architectural fraternity, whose natural propensity isn't one of uh, science and analysis and, you know, an analytical approach. It's, it's, it's more kind of creative and whatever. So you, don't, you didn't come from there. And then you had the other side, which was kind of abject engineering, which was kind of humanless. And so in a funny sort of way, you know, what we've, what, I mean, I've run um, operations inside reasonably large corporations. So I kind of see it from all sides. Um, and so really, I guess we wanted to try and, you know, go back five or six years ago, we started partnering with the Center for Evidence-Based Management, which is a, a very interesting um, global network that's headquartered in Amsterdam. And if you look it up, I mean, it, it, they really are, you know, heavyweights in the whole evidence-based management arena. <clears throat> and they're sort of zealots, really, around the use of um, research to answer questions. So we struck up a very good relationship with them, where, in effect, we would identify topics to be researched that we felt you know hadn't got enough science around them and uh, and they went away um uninfluenced by us or any sponsors uh, came back with the answers and of course if you've been anywhere near academic research you realize that 
getting answers to, to very simple questions uh, in a language that is uh, intelligible by humans is a really tough thing. So one of our jobs was really to take what they, they came forward with, try and challenge it, question it, understand it, and then translate it into language that you know, ordinary people can understand. But then go further and say, well, okay, well, what do we therefore do about this? What can practically we do? And so we, within the Advanced Workplace Institute, which is the kind of uh, the home for this work, um, you know, we provide reports and guidelines and, and things which link back to the research, but actually, you know, give you some practical guidance on what you should be doing. So that's kind of how it came about. And, uh, and it's been an interesting, it's, it's a lot of fun doing the kind of things that we do because you can kind of go in all sorts of directions. And we started out um, by asking a simple question, and that is what are the factors that have the biggest influence on knowledge work? And when we did that uh, piece of work, basically six things came back, but they were mostly about knowledge-based communities because actually that's where most of the research had been done. So we thought, well, that's kind of interesting. So we kind of got a good handle on that. But then we started to think, well, actually, what about, you know, knowledge workers are humans and they, you know, they have brains. So what are the things that have an impact upon the performance of the brain? Because if we understand what, if we can understand that and we can get people, you know, either to do the things or create the spaces and the environments that will help the brain work better. And then we can do things that help communities work better. You know, we're on a, we're on a roll, seem, seem to us. So we did those two pieces of work and then, the third one was really thinking about, well, you know, today we know a lot of people working remotely and increasingly with technology like Zoom and Teams, whatever, more of that is going to happen. So what happens when, you know, you do that? What, what sort of things matter? So the third study we did was called Managing the Agile Workforce and looked at all the research around the world uh, in relation to things to do with that kind of model of working. And that brought forward some stuff as well. So now you've got, you've got what, how does the, you know, research that helps you understand how to get the most out of the brain, then research that helps you to get the most out of communities, and then research that helps you to get the most out of brains in communities when they're not all together. So you start to sort of begin to you know, pull together quite an interesting picture because they're, you know, these three studies kind of, they all have strands that are worked through them. So you, you start building a, a picture and, um, and that's kind of led us into the world of neuroscience really, because what's very clear in the end is that, uh, you know, human brains are the currency of the future. Uh, I, I mean, you could argue it always was the case. But in fact, now, I mean, you take a lot of the organizations right at the pinnacle of the knowledge work world, you know, fundamentally, you, you, they, are the, they are the currency. They are what gets organizations into a place where they create great software or products or ad campaigns or whatever. And so, you know, there's, there's an increasing level of sensitivity, I think, and interest from companies to say, well, how can we create the conditions under which people can flourish. So I'm, I'm kind of laughing as you're going because every time I, I've got a question for you, you kind of go on and answer yeah. just naturally. <laughs> this is kind of funny yeah, because no, 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 I apologize because in essence that that's where I was going. So you've got all this research. Yeah. Obviously, companies comes with problems that they want to solve. Mm. How do you take that research and apply it, mm. understanding that you know you're a global company you will interfere, interface with different types of companies, different types of cultures. How do you bridge those and how do you help mm. implement those things? Well, I mean, cultures fundamentally are tribal behaviors, right? And, and tribal understandings. And you have to kind of understand what those are. But at the heart of all of those things are our human brains. And, you know, my thesis is that, you know, when we're born, um, sure, when we're born, we, we're broadly speaking, like we like, mini biological computers that haven't properly been programmed. And what happens in our early years, particularly up to the age of about eight, our models of the world start to, to develop. And those are what get ingrained. So you get national, uh, national cultures, which come about as a consequence of the way people are brought up and the, uh, and it kind of happens without really thinking about it. That, that, you know, one of the things that I, I think I've gleaned from all the things I've done around this are that, you know, we are in effect learning machines. And sometimes we learn consciously, but a lot of the time we learn subconsciously. We 
one of the things that we, we know from talking to neuroscientists is the brain is largely there, a large part of its capability is to keep you safe. And, uh, and so safety means that we don't do things that are likely to make us unsafe. So when we get to a point where we've been doing things over and over, and it's kind of worked out okay, it might not be brilliant, but it, it's not led to our demise socially or physically, then we're in a, we're in a, we're in a safe place. So at that point, we sort, we sort of start to hardwire those, um, those behaviors and thought processes and all the rest of it. And so, of course, when somebody comes along and says, hey, we'd like to introduce a new model of working or we want to take advantage of mobile technology to do things differently, the brain goes, mm, hang on, you know, you better, you better explain to me what it is you want me to change to and why you want me to change. And you better explain to me why I should change. Why should I want to do this? and how we're going to do it, how is it going to work, and then really, you know, help me to understand what's in it for me kind of thing. And I think the essence of what we do, I think, is, you know, to help organizations visualize what that might look like, but then help every individual who's got different programming uh, to make the transition to that new world. And then, you know, just as if you were learning a new golf shot or a new tennis shot, we have to keep you doing it. Because if we don't keep you doing it, you'll slip back into mm. the old, mm. the old model. And that again is the brain playing tricks on us, saying, you know, well maybe it's not quite as safe as, you know, you thought it was going to be. But it, it's it, it's it's a, you know, there's a lot of fuzz around this, but it's actually pretty logical stuff. Yeah. And do, do organisations come to you with one to solve a problem, mm. or they have a strategy they want to roll out and want help doing that? Bit of both, actually. Um, bit of both. You know, sometimes they're very practical situations. Two or two organisations have merged, and they want to crunch the portfolios together, but they want to introduce a new culture at the same time, move to new models of working, use it as a modernisation tool. So we often get that sort of scenario. There are other situations where clients have already decided that they're going to take a particular building, but they've decided they want to do it in a different way. They want to design and think more carefully about the experience how it plays into retention, recruitment, productivity, their own personalities, all, all those sorts of mm -hmm. things. Um, are, are there other situations where, you know, clients will come to us and say, look, we've got a lease expiring in 18 months time. We really do need to overhaul our culture. We've heard about all these magical things, you know, home working and, uh, you know, agile working and you know, all the things around productivity. And you know, what can you do? What can you do to help us? What new models could we apply? Is there a different way? So typically then we go through a, you know, a, a battery of studies uh, and then put together a series of options and help them to score those options against the drivers that, that they have. And often that will then lead into, you know, another commission. And whenever you're presenting that, are you present it to the mm. senior executive team? Yeah. That's typically who you, the audience would be. Mm. Do you think, um, it's just obviously your opinion and your evidence that you've witnessed, mm. culture, whenever people want to create it, does it come top down or bottom up? Um, I think it, it actually does both. I don't think you can do one without the other, but you do have to get permission and an and understanding at the top as well as further down, because a culture that is inspired from the bottom uh, and, it, and it can work actually, but it, it can be very frustrating as well because you, you hit a, you know, you hit a wall. I think very often the problem is that senior leaders, frankly, don't have the, they don't know how to do it. So very often, and, and they don't know how to do change either, because very often, you know, they'll, they'll issue an edict or there'll be, somebody will do a vision, um, you know, presentation or something. And and that's it. And there's an assumption that everybody will have understood that language, have, will have interpreted what it meant, and will have somehow worked out how to do things differently. And, uh, you know, I think very often that is, that's the problem. If you're going to change culture, you're really changing tribal behaviors, tribal, tribal norms. Mm. And you have to do that in a very systematic way. And it, it, has, to be, it has to be given oxygen and position, uh, permission from senior levels. But you know, the only way to get it to work in our experience has been to, to get people to learn about their own change and have used change agents, you know, who become who you train up to actually help to, to make the shift happen. Mm. 
No, it's, it's, it's interesting. So whenever, so we, obviously you want to shift culture and I know culture is not, is, is in it one element of what you do. There's a lot of it. Change yeah. management got a big mm. element of it, but whenever you have those mergers mm. uh, coming together, mm. what, what are the key risks that manage, uh, you know, organizations are trying to manage mm. that you sort of uh, mm. help with obviously understand the culture? Well, actually. I mean, you know, merger situations are a bit worrying for people, aren't they? <clears throat> Very often, you know, people are worried about if, if there is a merger, uh, you know, are we going to consolidate jobs? Uh, are we moving locations? Uh, you know, am I going to be managed by somebody from that other organization that we don't really trust? Um, you know, there's all sorts of things going on. So the risk is that during that period, the better people who are probably in demand anyway, headhunters are already, you know, around them are getting calls and saying, well, you know, you might want to think about there's a role here with X, Y, and Z company. So you, I think one of the biggest risks is actually that you, you know, you lose people. But the other risk is that you lose energy, you know, because people start, you know, worrying and they, you know, they're, they're what you would call their discretionary energy begins to, you know, deplete it. And, you know, they start doing the very bare minimum instead of, you know, continuing to be kind of, you know, behind the game, behind the, the business. I think the other thing about it is that, of course, they, if they've got a new leader at the top of the business and, you know, it's not clear what the business is about. We know from our research, one of the, one of the key things you want is vision and goal clarity, well, because that's what kind of helps people to be focused on the, focus their energy on the things that, that matter and get motivated. If that's not there, then all of a sudden that's another Another thing that will sort of deplete the, uh, the energy. And on that, what's the best way to communicate that that you've seen? Because we know mm. emails going out may not uh, mm. be read or mm. adhere to. I, I think um, I think there are two or three different. I, I, I don't think there is one way, actually. I think you've got to you attack it lots of different ways. But in the end, you know, I think you've got to get leaders comfortable, uh, both in terms of their style and in terms of the content and their understanding, the depth of their understanding, you got them comfortable enough to go out and actually sit with people and talk through some of these things mm -hmm. and be honest. Um, now, I think the difficulty we have in a lot of businesses is that leaders are actually, and I have to say there's probably more men than women, are really not very comfortable about sitting in a room with people who might ask them awkward questions. And I think one of the big misunderstandings in misunderstandings in life is that awkward questions mean people don't like you. In fact, awkward questions are what people need to get answered in order for them to get comfortable with change. And sometimes the aggression that they come forward with is, is a little more than you want. But without that kind of open dialogue and that sort of uh, that two way um, honest open dialogue, it's very difficult to get these things through. But I think that's why I think we use video quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Video is a very good medium for getting across ideas in a relatively short period of time and consistently across the population. Um, yeah, I, you know, those are the primary thing. Our websites are okay, but they're, they're a bit passive yeah, sometimes, yeah, you know. Yeah, they are. Yeah. So obviously in a lot of the research you do, uh, completed in the past, mm -hmm. what you're doing in the future and how you sort of obviously operate within your organization, is there a specific metric that you think is a benchmark to mm -hmm. use when it comes to measuring productivity of employees mm -hmm. or experience? And mm -hmm. I know that's sort of where you're going mm -hmm. with, with what you're trying to evolve with the, your, your, your company. Yeah. Yeah. Is, there, is there something, because I know it's hard to yeah. distill yeah. that one number. Well, I think there, there are, I mean, there are so many different components. Uh, what we have done is we've developed a tool. We haven't really used it yet, if I'm honest, but we've developed a tool that looks at the, the enablers and the detractors um, for productivity. Uh, and the, the enablers and detractors are not just about space. They're about technology as well, but they're also about behavior and, and personal practices. So, you know, as an example, you know, we, we kind of have a, a handle on the things you need to do in order to make sure you are in the best shape you, you can be when you turn up at the, at the office. So are you doing those? If yes, tick. When we get you in the office, you know, are we destroying your performance by putting you into meeting rooms where, you know, you're distracted because you can hear other people through the other side of the wall? You can't get connected to your Wi-Fi or your laptop. 
um, you're not with the people you need to be. You know, the, so so we're we're kind of looking at uh, metrics that embrace a basket of things like that, so that we can actually begin to be a bit clear with people. But the other big, the, the the one metric that I think increasingly for knowledge-based communities, um, you know, I think I might have mentioned earlier on with uh, social cohesion we know from all the research around knowledge-based communities is the most important thing. And it's important because it enables us to have difficult conversations and enable, if we're socially cohesive, we've, we've, we're kind of friendly towards mm -hmm. each other. We're trusting. Um, so if we're trusting and friendly, then you would probably like to be more generous with your knowledge than I would, you know, you would have been otherwise, but you're very happy to challenge and we're, we can through that, constructive challenge we can gain new stuff and this is not just in a team but this is it across the community so for me uh, actually one of the most uh, powerful metrics is is the number of people you know who you would believe you are friendly with as a proportion of the number of people that you believe are in your work community and I think that's a that's a metric mm -hmm. that I think is uh, uh, is one that you can get at quite quickly because uh, I would be, uh, my, my experience is that if you've got 200 people on the floor, there are probably no more than 10 that you would say you are kind of friendly with, you know, you'll have a coffee with, or right, you, right. which is kind of weird, really. Yeah. When, and particularly when we talk about the need to have, you know, communities together, uh, you know, that it's, uh, it, it's, it's kind of, that's, that's an interesting area. So I wanted to sort of go into that. So say, for example, you're in a situation, 210 people on the floor. Mm. How can organizations help increase that mm. so that that individual can go yeah. to 10 to 15 to 20? Yeah. Is there yeah, yeah. tactics that you've seen at work? Yeah. Well, I think there are, there are a number of things. So first of all, you know, in the, in the future, I think workplace management organizations should be looking at managing the space technology but also the social mm -hmm. taking taking responsibility for the 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 bringing about of those uh, those relationships so the sort of things you can do are pretty simple actually you know i mean what's wrong with organizing the you know the part the floor party uh, events you know creating events not you know force people to go to them but clubs more clubs more networks so those are those are some of the sorts of things. There are one or two interesting tools out there though um, that I've come across. But basically, like like they're like speed dating. Mm -hmm. So you basically load all the email addresses of people in your organisation, and you say, "Who do I want to get to talk to who?" And it pro it proactively pings you and says, "Oh hi, you know Steve, uh, Andrew. It would be a good idea for you and Andrew to get a coffee." So you and Andrew get a coffee, and you feedback that you've had a coffee. And you now start to see that um, you know the, the the spark of a new relationship yeah, actually is yeah. coming out. And my experience is actually that when a lot of people, um, a lot of people given the opportunity, will start up relationships and will talk and will open up, and then yeah. will that will flourish on the floor. But without that little spark, it never happens. No, I think that's a tremendous tremendous tool. That's that, that's fantastic. What's the name of that? It's called. It's actually called Spark. Spark. Spark okay. collaboration. No, I'm definitely gonna look into. Yeah, that. that's, I, I, that's I like pretty it. interesting. Yeah. Um, and one point I just wanted to touch on before, whenever you were going through, what are the sort of the measurements? And the mm. first measurement you mentioned was the individual themselves. Mm. They have to come to work. Yeah. Prepared to work, and I think it's this big thing that's missing from a lot of the communication publication we see. You know, what is the responsibility? of the individual, you're employed by an organization, what are you doing every day yeah. to come to that office prepared to work yeah. and, and put in your effort? Yeah. So I think it's great that you you you, you started there. Um, so one question I do ask everybody, mm -hmm. uh, what one piece of advice and guidance would you give or tip to maximize workplace productivity and employee experience? Be it yourself, what you do within your organization or what you've seen work well in another organization? Um, blimey, that's a big question, isn't it? I mean, I think what I've always tried to do in our business is to is to create an organisation in which um, there is very little hierarchy, and where, I mean, we don't we for instance we don't have an organisation chart. We just have a community of people. Projects come in, we choose the people. They go on the project. There's training. 
we run events for our people, we run online training, we run a thing called the Guru program to help our, our own people understand more of the, the research so they can apply it in their, in their work. But I am, um, you know, for us, my, our experience, of course, we, we have a hub here in New York and we have a hub in London, but you won't find too many of our people turning up there every day. So we, we work really, our workplace is a digital workplace. So we use Microsoft Teams. We use, we, you know, we insist on video being on all the time. You know, why would you want to, you know, I mean, it's a bit like you and me here, yeah. me saying, well, yeah. I tell you what, Steve, let's turn the lights off. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's just barking mad, basically. Um, and so, you know, but, but I just, I suppose just to get to the nub of your point, what you want to try and do is to create an environment in which things are easy, um, which is not always that easy with technology the way it is today. But, you know, for me, that's what you've got to do. Make, make things easy, make things frictionless, make things as comfortable for people to, to be themselves mm. as, you, as you can do. And, and, you know, that way people will kind of be honest and flourish and create, I think. No, that's great. Thank you. And Andy, look, thank you for you. For, you've been great to me. You've been giving me a lot of time and uh, shared a lot of your information. Obviously, we've probably some things that you've allowed us to on Open Source Workplace. So thank you. And, no, it's uh, a pleasure. Keep, yeah. keep doing it. Keep doing it. I will do. I will do. So, <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, pleasure. It.